come up that I'll try to carry. Uh, Doug Ellison, over on your left and my right, is a native of North Dakota, raised on a farm and ranch. He's a former employee of the State Historical Society of North Dakota, where he served as a site supervisor at Fort Buford and the Chateau de Moore. Uh, with his wife, Mary, Doug presently owns and operates one of the best independent bookstores on the Great Plains, Western Edge Books. Uh, he has written several books himself and articles, and he is now the mayor of Medora. <laughs> we Next to him, David Piper. Uh, David's career spans over 30 years with the U.S. Forest Service, the last six of which have been as the supervisor of the national grasslands in North Dakota and northwestern South Dakota. He is responsible, think of this, for the day-to-day -day management of over one million acres of the public's lands, including the Little Missouri National Grasslands, the largest unit of the national grassland system. His fascination with the prairie and grasslands grew exponentially with an assignment to the Comanche National Grasslands as district ranger in the early 1990s. Welcome, David Piper. <laughs> On my immediate right, Jan Swenson is the executive director for the North Dakota Badlands Conservation Alliance, founded in 1999. Members hail from Sentinel Butte, Medora, Belfield, Bismarck, Fargo, and Cairo, Egypt. Uh, the Badlands Conservation Alliance is the primary author of the Prairie Legacy Wilderness Proposal, promoting an open citizen discussion for wilderness designation on 4% of the Little Missouri National Grassland. Welcome, Jan Swenson. <laughs> Mark Trimmer has permitted and drilled wells, primarily in the North Dakota and Montana portions of the Williston Basin, but also in other western states, including Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, New Mexico, and Idaho. He started working on environmental issues in the early 1990s with a focus on federal land use. He graduated from Montana Tech in 1980 as a petroleum engineer. Welcome back to North Dakota. <laughs> and James Oderman is a native of Billings County, along with his wife, uh, Leona. He's an agricultural producer, raising mostly small grains and beefalo cattle. They have a family operation that, by today's standards, is modest. Their operation is all on deeded land, either owned by them or rented. Welcome, Jim Oderman. Thank you. Welcome all. Roger Lothspike, you're not in the premises, are you? Fair enough. We invited Roger Lothspike uh, from Mile City. Unfortunately, he's been detained probably by icy roads. Uh, Dan, I want you to, to get into this whenever you want and to, um, and, and, and to point the way, to clarify, to raise questions, etc. I'm sure the audience will want to ask questions too. But Jim, let me start with you, since you are a rancher. Um, the question really is, what, what will the badlands of western North Dakota look like 100 years from now, and how, what's, how should we think about this? What, what, what should we value? What, what should be on our minds as this sort of historic set of pressures comes to bear on this fragile but extraordinary place? Well, I'm glad I got the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> but. When I look at the Badlands, the first thing that I see is grass. And the grass really is an indication of the ecosystem that presently exists. Quite honestly, if we're going to be able to see a Badlands as we see it today, we're going to make sure that we have to take care of the grass. And that grass means that we have to provide opportunities for the people who are managing, owning that land and are caretakers of that to make sure that that grass is properly managed and manipulated. That doesn't mean non-use. That doesn't mean overuse. It means to make that we have to put in place management practices that will provide for the continued growth and expansion of that grass. Now, one of the things that, that I really think about and I feel really strongly about in terms of agriculture, and, and I just want to mention this quote, because this is from Ralph Waldo Emerson. And before the conference here, I got the email from Clay via Sharon that, hey, let's make this be a humanities discussion if possible. 
Well, I thought the quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson was especially appropriate because here's what he says. Agriculture is the mother of the arts and the foundation of all society. The farmer, rancher, if you will, stands close to nature. He obtains from the earth the bread and the meat, the food which was not he or she causes to be. And I think in that context, that's the way we need to look at it. We're caretakers of really a very precious resource. But we also need to know that there's a lot of, should I say, opportunities or assets that can be used and we can still maintain our surface and maintain the beauty that we presently have. Let me just ask a very quick follow-up. You say the key is managing the grass, but there, and we've been doing that for more than 100 years. How well are we managing the grass? Well, l let me follow up by saying managing the grass. It was back in the 1920s when scientists recommended to our producers that you could defoliate 75% of the leaves on our grass and still be successful. It didn't work. The 30s are a good example of that. Yes, we had drought, but that was an absolute failure. It was back in 1955 when a scientist by the name of Whitman said, hey, we were wrong. We can defoliate 50% of the leaves, but we have to leave 50% of that if we're going to be successful. And what you're going to be successful in, in addition to leaving the structure on the top of the ground, what you're really doing is providing growth underneath the ground because a healthy plant is really the result of a healthy subsoil. And so we need to make sure that we mix those two things together. The biology is as important as the beauty. And when I'm talking about the biology, I'm talking about the above ground and the below ground structure. I know you have lots more to say, but I appreciate you're making a brief opening statement. Doug Ellison, you're the mayor of Medora. You've got a, you wear several hats at the moment. Give us your perspective. Thank you, Clay. Uh, nice to be here. Uh, in regard to uh, tourism and recreation, where that will be in the Badlands 100 years from now, uh, I expect it would play a larger role than it does now. Uh, the reason for that is simply uh, our population, national population, will obviously continue to grow. Uh, people need a getaway. Uh, the, the Badlands offers, uh, offers that getaway, both in terms of, uh, of the recreation and, and just seeing the beauty of it. But a big part of that, too, would be heritage tourism. Uh, obviously, the Little Missouri Badlands have a colorful history. Uh, in Medora, in particular, we're always trying to focus on that history and kind of elaborate on that history, give people uh, kind of an educational experience along with their, their uh, tourism trip. Um, actually, I think the, the recreation industry predates probably any other industry in the Badlands. Uh, back in, I believe it was 1856, uh, Sir George Gore, who was an Irish nobleman, uh, Dan mentioned earlier how comparing the, the American Great Plains to the savannah of Africa. Well, Sir George Gore was on safari, basically, on the American Great Plains, uh, part of his hunting trip, and he was, he's been criticized ever since, even, even while he was on this hunting trip, for the slaughter that he did. Uh, he killed thousands of, of uh, the Great Plains animals just for sport and trophies. But part of his hunting trip was up the Little Missouri Badlands in 1856. Uh, as soon as the railroad came through in 1880, uh, if you look back at the newspaper uh, archives, uh, some of the very first uh, things uh, said was that now, now this beautiful area would be opened up to tourism and hunters, recreational hunters. That's what brought Theodore Roosevelt out here the first time. He was a recreational hunter. Uh, of course, became a rancher and a conservationist. So it's interesting to me how Roosevelt, uh, in his own uh, in his own self incorporated so many of these different aspects that we're talking about today. Uh, but to sum up, uh, again, I, I, uh, I foresee tourism and recreation uh, still playing an increasingly vital role in the Badlands.
Thank you. Mark, uh, give us some perspective. From an energy, particularly an oil and gas standpoint, it's really hard to say what it's going to be 100 years out there. It could be no oil and gas activity left on the Badlands, or it could be fairly intense in any given place, all driven by economics. The issue around oil and gas and probably other energy things is that they're very transient compared to the agriculture and the things that will be here uh, after we're gone and, the, and before we're here. I guess the key to around that is how do you manage those, for lack of a better word, Dave, catastrophic impacts that we have for a short period of time while we're there, so they don't impact things like the grass and the water quality that you need to rehabilitate the grasslands and the natural ecosystem after we're gone. So ranching will be here long after we're gone, and uh, so will tourism. Uh, so it's just moderating the impacts of what appears to get the economic advantage in the short period of time. And then the unholy alliance with Dr. Worcester of government and uh, industry, whether it's good or not, it's brought nice roads to places. Either that's good or that's bad. It's um, funded the uh, building of many schools in small areas. Is that good or bad? It electrified a fair bit of the countryside out there. Probably good, bad, but in 100 years, who knows if we'll even have any activity here. But you know, Mark, you used a pretty strong term there, catastrophic temporary impact. Um, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> well, I don't know. The, the, uh, Any time you cut a road, even going up to your place, it's pretty catastrophic. When you bring in big equipment and slice off half of a hill to make a flat spot to put a rig, I don't know how you would describe that other than catastrophic. <laughs> well, my reaction to that would be that we need to have a system of accountability. Absolutely. And I, I think that our state legislature has done a nice job of making sure that takes place. I would go so far as to say that I think the oil industry, the gas exploration industry, really is in tune with making sure that what we have is preserved at least returning it as much to original site location as was and is possible. Mm -hmm. I would say that they're working closely with landowners. Uh, this isn't only an issue that impacts ranching. Uh, Doug talked about tourism. I don't know how many hunters that I know that are what I call road hunters. There are times when I'm guilty of that too. I mean, it's easy to get on one of those oil roads and geez, we can find a nice buck just sitting off there in the, in the draw rather than really getting out and, as Theodore Roosevelt had noted, really experience the wilderness, the wild that does exist out there. So it has impacted that. I don't know that that's good or bad. I think that one thing that's important is that it's helped maintain the harvest of the wildlife because the wildlife do not provide the same opportunities for grass revitalization that beef cattle do, and I'm prejudiced because I'm a beef cattle producer, but the science has shown that beef cattle really do provide assistance to grass. Jan Swanson. Uh, I guess first I, I, I feel a need to say, um, to hope that, that all the people in this audience really recognize what an incredible landscape we have, how lucky we are to have the Little Missouri National Grassland. It's, it's the largest of the 20 in the national grassland system. Uh, a study was done in, uh, that came out in 2004 by a, a group of, a network of conservation groups uh, funded in, and spearheaded by the World Wildlife Fund um, that across the, the entire Great Plains, um, the Little Missouri National Grassland was in the top three valuable landscapes. Um, you know, we're hugely lucky to have this, this landscape in, in our state. Um, as far as what we're going to see 100 years from now, I guess I would have to um, say that it's as big of a question as Theodore Roosevelt had when he looked at conservation um, 100 years ago. Uh, 
global warming is a major issue, especially in a semi-arid landscape like the Little Missouri. Um, there is a good chance that, there is a chance <laughs> that with global climate change, what we now have is semi-arid will approach desert. And if that should be the case, we will be looking at a totally different management on those acres than we're looking at right now. Um, I, I think that um, James might agree that it's not always easy to be a rancher in the Little Missouri River area. I, things are up and down, drought comes around often. Um, it's not always easy to make a living. Uh, I think the risks will be much greater. You know, should that sort of thing happen, we may be looking at the kind of, of significant restoration um, that Dan was talking about. If that doesn't happen, you know, I'm an environmentalist in North Dakota. <laughs> um, I should say that the, the president of our organization is a hunter. You know, so looking at that earlier today. Oops, sorry. Sorry, no worries. Um, looking at that earlier today. Yeah. Uh, I think, I think generally conservationists, environmentalists in North Dakota want to see those ranchers stay on the land. Um, the level, the degree to which we love that landscape, so do they. And, and it would be pretty hard for me to want to see anything that would kick them off. Um, at the same time, if, if we're looking at, at really significant climate changes, the, it may be managed in a totally different manner with much more commonality with, with um, ranchers working together on a larger scale than they are working on it right now. Thank you. Uh, David Piper, you have a unique responsibility and burden uh, to, be, to supervise a million federal acres and, and built into your mission is that many different uses are um, important. Tell us what that means for you. Well, absolutely, Clay. First, I want to thank you and Dickinson State University for hosting this symposium. Thank you, Dan, for coming out. Uh, I think you really provided some great insights. Uh, I looked at the schedule and I'm the government representative. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I scratched my head and, uh, yes, I am here to help. <laughs> I want you to understand that. I know a little bit about economics, not too much, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> so uh, maybe we can figure that out later on in the symposium. But uh, when I looked at the question, you know, what will the Little Missouri Badlands look like in 100 years? I, I pondered on this for days and weeks. I talked to Clay about two, three, weeks ago about it, and my response is, it depends. Now, isn't that uh, prophetic? I think what Dan talked about, I think you need to know the history of a place. What shaped the Badlands? What forces? What disturbances? Obviously, water, wind, fire, her buffalo, now cattle. All those forces shaped it, Native Americans, early settlers. We have to take that into consideration. We need to take into consideration the culture of the people who live in the Badlands. Some of the toughest people in North Dakota live out on that landscape. Many of them left because of the Great Depression, but some stayed behind to try to eke out a living. They're not real happy with the federal government. There's a lot of controversy. There has been since the federal government began the land utilization project, projects in the 30s and 40s. They were culminated in the Bankhead Jones Farm Tenant Act. A number of agencies tried to administer the grasslands. And finally, in the 1950s, the lands were given to the U.S. Forest Service. And I think the Forest Service took them rather reluctantly. But we're here. Uh, we've been here about 50 years. And I'm happy to be here. It's one of the 
the greatest places I've ever worked. It's one of the most exciting landscapes. You know, the, the quote that I throw out there, and it's attributed to Roosevelt, anybody can love the mountains, but it takes soul to love the prairie. <laughs> I think that's very true. Uh, for some reason, probably most of us in this room have that love for this prairie. I can't describe it. I try to talk to my kids about it. Some of them love it, some of them don't. But anyway, we have to understand the history. Now, what I'm concerned about right now is development in the grasslands. Not so much oil and gas. I think that's temporary. It may be out there in 100 years, I'm not sure. I think industry does a great job. You know, we need energy. Uh, corporations like Hess and ConocoPhillips do excellent <coughs> jobs out there. The footprint is becoming smaller and smaller. You look at the Bakken plate, you know, one pad for every two sections. Probably 10 or 15 years ago, you know, you had a pad every half a section. So the technology is getting better and better. What we have to figure out is how we stop the ranchettes, the subdivisions, perhaps, you know, we can't stop this, but you know, we have outside buyers coming in for recreation purposes, for hunting, solitude, recreation, and that won't be stopped. The places I've worked in my career, primarily Colorado, Wyoming, and Montana, I've seen rampant subdivision. Well, we still have an opportunity here. It really hasn't started. I think Medora's seeing a little bit, and I think that's fine. But we need to develop a strategy or vision for the grasslands to preserve what we have out there. We still have that chance. Now, look at some of North Dakota's laws or, or regulations. And one that really kind of rankles me is that the North Dakota Game and Fish allows a resident tag for a person that owns 160 acres in the Badlands. They can go out and get an elk every year. Now, I live in Bismarck. I can get one in a lifetime. So if you own 160 acres of the Badlands, you can get a resident tag on an annual basis. People are thinking about that. They buy a ranch and they subdivide it. Four or six guys will buy it. Each will get his 160 acres, his or her slice of heaven. And then what happens, it makes it more difficult to manage the landscape. Once you start subdividing, you lose your, you know, your management flexibility. So we need to think about how to keep that landscape intact and keep it whole and keep ranchers ranching on those lands. Now, I do think public lands will be out there in 100 years. They may not be the national grasslands. They may grow, as Dan said. Maybe other entities will come in and buy more ranches. And you know, maybe we'll have 2 million acres of public lands 100 years from now. I certainly hope so. But we have to keep that rancher out on the landscape. You know, we have to have a, an ecologically sustainable landscape, and we have to have, uh, well, that's it. It has to be sustainable for both that rancher and the ecology of the landscape. So, you know, having said that, I think we've got a great opportunity here in North Dakota. I think it's going to take the people of the North Dakota and Great Plains to come together to make it happen. And how do you do that but through collaboration? All the stakeholders have to come to the table and talk about it, develop a vision, and then move forward. Uh, the, the idea that uh, you can sit back and veto a public action, I think those days are slowly coming to an end. I think all the stakeholders have to come to the table, develop the vision, and then move forward. Thank you. Let me, thank you. Let me tell you where we're headed here. I want to get the audience in. They've been sitting so patiently all day. I know people have thoughts. I know you want to talk to each other, and you're only beginning to say what you want to say. I'm first going to turn to Dan. That's why you're here, is to help. I want to hear what you're hearing here, what you're listening to, what, what, you're, what you're hearing in this conversation. But let me be Roger Lothspike for just a minute. You said we have to stop the ranchettes. I met Roger Lotzbike on my hike in the Little Missouri two years ago, and he said, why do you want to stop the ranchettes? If there's somebody that has money to pay and wants to live in paradise out there and goes out and finds a willing seller, who are you to say that a ranchette is any less important than a cattle ranch or a tourist entity or anything else? Why is a ranchette so unpleasant to your view of the world? Well, everything that it brings with it. It brings roads, water development, uh, more people, 
onto a landscape that can barely support much life at all. It's going to put more stress and strain on local governments to provide services, ambulance services, fire services, all those types of things. What I'm saying, for the little Missouri, we have an opportunity. I'm not saying we're going to pursue that opportunity, but if you want to, you better speak up now. I'm not talking about zoning, but if we keep ranchers whole, if we keep them healthy, if we provide them incentives to stay on the landscape, I think we can prevent the subdivisions from occurring out there. We can use conservation easements. You know, simply a conservation easement is the difference between development value and agricultural value. The Nature Conservancy contributes towards that. You know, government entities can do that. We want to keep that rancher whole, and then we'll keep the landscape whole. Dan, what are you hearing? Well, is this on? Yes, it will Can be. Can you guys hear me? It is. Um, I think one of the things I'm hearing is that uh, Teddy Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot would be pleased at the role of government in trying to help figure this out. We're 100 years from them now. And my suspicion is that in another 100 years, your successor is probably going to be playing this same role here, saying perhaps some of the same things, because the need for sustaining the ecology of the local place is going to be as pressing probably a century from now, maybe more so with global climate change uh, looming or upon us by then, uh, as it is now. I think uh, the elephant in the room clearly is global climate change, and none of us knows which direction it's going to take us. Um, and it would seem maybe from the perspective of, of North Dakota that North Dakota would be far enough north that, you know, we might welcome balmier winters and, uh, you know, it may become the new Florida of second homeowners or something, who knows? I mean, certainly it would possibly create a longer growing season. But I think the troubling part of it is that we do have this historical record that indicates that rising temperatures on the Great Plains aren't necessarily good for the ecology. What you get is uh, not, not really a collapse of the grass cover, but during the Dust Bowl, grass coverage of much of the Great Plains was down to about 20% of the possible coverage of the landscape. And in effect, grasses were being, were separated by uh, large areas of bare ground, bare ground that yielded dust into the sky. And that sort of uh, heightened temperature and lowered precipitation uh, s sort of amped up into a future is going to produce something that, I mean, I, this is one of the things that makes the difficulty of projecting what the hundred year uh, outcome of the area uh, is so, so uh, daunting for us is that we simply don't know what climate change is going to do. I, James and I were having a conversation over lunch. Maybe one of the things he could do is, he showed me a document. He, we talked last night. Um, and I was talking about this pattern I described in, in uh, the introduction I did of, of this sort of embrace and retreat from the Great Plains. Uh, and one of the things that, I mean, I teach the, uh, the Great Plains and the Rocky Mountains and courses at the University of Montana. And one of the things I say, to somewhat incredulous students in western Montana where everybody is constantly afraid of rampant runaway growth. Every decade uh, the population has increased by another 10 or 12 or 15 percent. And what I tell those students in western Montana is, well if you don't like this, go to eastern Montana. The high point of population in eastern Montana was 1920. And the population has gone down in those counties decade by decade ever since. James put together the figures for the local area. Well, it's really interesting. <laughs> uh, I did have the opportunity to enjoy fine food <laughs> with Dan twice in a row. Perhaps we can make it a three-peat. Uh -huh. uh, but back in 1910, Billings County, 
had 10,186 people. Now keep in mind that Billings County at that time also included what is now present day Slope County and Golden Valley County. So if we even extrapolated some of those numbers out of there, I would expect that the population of Billings County would have been around 5,000, give or take, you know, a couple percentage points. The population of Billings County today, now I should say today, the 2000 census was 888. But just let me give you a quick rundown. 1920, it was 3126, 3140 in 1930, 2531 in 1940, 1777 in 1950, 1960 was 1513, and that trend continues till, as I noted, 888 in 2000. So the exodus, is it a result of government-owned land? Farmers not able to make, a, or ranchers not able to make a living, farmers not able to, to be able to assimilate the situation? You know, if we knew the answer to that, we probably would be millionaires. Uh, but there is an ebb and flow of people, and it's, it's obvious that it's not an easy life, but those that chose to stay, and I think that was addressed earlier, they're here because they want to be, not because they have to be. You say ebb and flow, it looks a lot like ebb. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see much flow there. Well, but now let's go back here. In, in 1880, or 1890, we only had 170 people in Billings County. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's good news. <laughs> uh, thoughts? Who has thoughts or questions you want to put to any or all of these panelists? This is your chance, right back here. Yes, thank you. Um, Speak up. With this idea of how it will look like in 100 years, I think the one thing that we haven't talked about really yet is the framework already in place for preserving it the way it is, and that's what further wilderness designations within the National Forest Service plan of the National Grasslands. And Jan, I wish you'd speak to that just a little bit. I know you and the Conservation uh, Society have been very involved with working for more wilderness legislation and, and getting newspapers involved. And maybe you could just say a couple more things about that, because I think that would be the framework for preserving it, as it is, as we'd like to see it still in the review. I think you all heard that. Go ahead, Jan. Um, well, our proposal would, uh, would preserve very little of it. Um, uh, it we're talking about 4% of the 1.1 million acres in the in the national grasslands and they are in uh, five distinct areas within that national grasslands um, two of them in mckenzie county and then um, two or three of them down in the southern badlands um, south of medora and one west of the south unit of the park um, and we have multiple concerns why it is so essential that we do this at this time. For one thing, we're down to 4% 4, 4 uh, in the last grasslands plan signed in 2002, there's only, there's less than 40,000 acres that are managed as suitable for wilderness. Um, bless you, Mark, but there's, <laughs> you know, 95% um, of the of the Little Missouri National Grasslands is open for oil and gas development. Uh, right now, the Medora Ranger District is looking at um, uranium development, uranium mining coming into the Little Missouri National Grasslands. And, and what the company has um, described is, is strip mining. I mean, it's not strip mining on the huge scale that we might think of with coal, but it is strip mining. And um, if, right now, they're just doing very um, immediate exploratory types of activities, going out there with, with what I might call a Geiger counter <laughs> and, and, and looking to see what the possibilities are. But the 2002 plan does not deal with uranium at all. And uh, the, uh, rain, the chief ranger of the Medora Ranger District has suggested that um, if the company finds what they're looking for and they want to move forward, it's going to open the entire plan because uranium was never dealt with before. And in his words, it would put all areas again on the table. Um, it's it's 
did you want to break in? I'm sure welcome to. How long ago did you talk to them? Yeah, that's what I'm really curious okay, about. Okay, because initially that was what they were going to do. I talked to him this, uh, this summer, but I'd be really curious about that. Dave, do you have a uh, <laughs> <laughs> Who's that chief ranger you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I have the pleasure. Well, the important point to make, I mean, not either, but the strip mining is just, it We'll, ad we'll address that. I, let me urge everyone in the audience to speak up because we want everyone to be able to hear each other. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the pleasures of multiple use, uh, thanks to Gifford and uh, Theodore. But uh, it is an issue. Uh, it's very early uh, in the analysis of the issue. Jan said, right, they're out doing some prospecting. It's my understanding right now we've got some shovel work going on with Geiger counters and stuff. If they come back with a proposal to develop, we obviously will get into an environmental impact statement situation to amend our plan. We will have a full array of alternatives. So I think it's premature to say strip mining may happen in situ or whatever. It may not happen. No action will be included, will be addressed. You know, if there are significant health and safety issues, I don't think we're going to do this on public lands. But we don't know that yet. You know, we don't have all the information. And if I'm correct, that analysis has to take place over an entire year before that proposal Oh, I would suspect that uh, an EIS of that magnitude and significance would. Not EIS, would... but I mean actual proposal by the company as far as, you know, Oh, yeah, years. We're talking years. Yeah. yeah. Other thoughts? How are you going to protect the existing oil and gas leases from the uranium miners? <laughs> can I, can yes, I just address that? Yes, yes. Um, I think you're going to get the best attorneys you have, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> We're trying to feel sorry for you here. Um, that was uh, the public meetings that I have attended regarding uranium in the Little Missouri National Grasslands. Um, yes, it would take time. Um, there would likely be a couple of of NEPA, National Environmental Policy Act processes that would be gone through with public participation. Up to 10 years is, is what I heard at the public meetings. 10 years is not very long. It's not. <laughs> but and, you know, under, and, understand when proposals like this come in, you know, I. I can't, Ranger Jablonski can't shut the door and board it up and say, get the hell out of here. We don't want to hear about it. We have to address it. You know, we're, we're required to by law. It doesn't mean we're going to do it, but we have to look at it. Doug, let me ask you a question. You know, we're talking about uranium, oil, maybe coal bed methane, the Bakken, um, lots of things going on. Um, you were saying cultural tourism, heritage tourism always has been, always will be a big part of the draw out here and the economic uh, profile of this region. I can speak personally when I go out to the National Park Overlook and see um, the flaring of oil wells. I, I'm less interested as a cultural tourist than I was when I didn't see that. When I'm at the Elkhorn Ranch and I hear the thump, 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 thump of that well on the hill over there, that degrades my experience at that place. Where does the, where does the moment come when these things are incompatible? <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, it's, it, it is a two-edged sword. Uh, as, you know, as a private business person who relies on tourism in Medora, my wife and I, uh, yeah, we, we hear complaints about that you know, from people who want to enjoy the pristine landscape. Since I got involved in city government out there, uh, thank God for energy. You know, this oil and gas tax uh, helps us be there. Uh, so we, we need the energy development. Uh, it's, uh, I don't know where, the, where the, the meeting point needs to be, if there is a good meeting point between the two. Uh, but but we, we need both, uh, we really do. And uh, 
you know, you just you just try to try to uh, find a happy medium there somewhere. Mark, what about this footprint? Because the light footprint, I get it about the number of pads and all of this, but um, it doesn't take much to mar the pristine experience in the Badlands. And I know efforts are made to mitigate it, but just talk a little bit about these two things coming into conflict. Well, I take, approach that conflict from a bit of a different way. I, uh, I would describe my, I like the outdoors in the Badlands, I spent a lot of time tromping around there, but I'm not sure I would describe that as pristine experience. I find the marks of man everywhere I go. Uh, late at night, I can hear the jets flying over. I mean, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure that I would call it a pristine experience. Uh, enjoyable, but pristine, no. Uh, but I think in a lot of cases as an industry, we can do a better job to minimize those types of put put putts as you're looking over the landscape. and. Uh, reduce the flaring of oil and gas. The, uh, but at the end of the day, it's an industrial zone when you have an oil and gas thing, and how, I'm not sure how you do make that compatible with all the other uses, particularly if you're looking for a wilderness experience other than keep us out in one way or another. Jim? You know, the old expression that the world is run by those who show up, I think, based on what I've heard today, it, Theodore Roosevelt's idea about, you know, the conservation as the protector is far behind conservation as a developer. That should be changed to the world is run by those who show up with money. Because the reality of it is that, and I've had friends who have had ranches in the Badlands and not even in the Badlands, next to the Badlands and this sort of thing. It wasn't their decision to want to sell because they didn't like the way of life but somebody showed up on their doorstep who convinced them with some dollars that they needed to move on to a, another way of life or to retire. So I, I think it's important that we frame it within the context that reality sometimes is something that we ask for, but we really don't like the answer. And so as we look down the road, what are we gonna be like in 100 years, you know, we're really economically driven, but I think we do have some things that we need and want to save. Now, I pride myself in the fact that I'm in the egg business, and I would say this from the rooftops. I think our producers today are, are some of the best and frontline environmentalists in the world. Say that again. Our producers today are some of the best and frontline environmentalists in the world. They're up to date in terms of practices. They're up to date in terms of preserving what we have. And they certainly want to provide opportunities for people to be able to share the beauty and the experiences that they live on a day to day basis. I think what it really amounts to is what kind of relationships and communication processes are we going to be able to put in place so that we can carry forward the beauty that we have? It's also, oh, sorry. You first since you started <laughs> and then you second, go ahead. It's also hard to argue that uh, when you're out there for a heritage experience that energy is not part of the heritage of the Badlands and exploitation in various different ways. So you take the good with the bad. When we drill wells along the interstate of our leases under the park, we need to put a special kiosk for the tourists that come in and spend hours explaining what the oil and gas business is to them and how a drilling rig works. So there's, that's part of the uh, whole heritage mix uh, also. Okay. I was gonna address my question to James. That's fine. Um, you're, you're all on deeded land, is that right? Correct. Okay. And. Um, <coughs> Folks in the audience may or may not know that um, the little Missouri National grassland being public land, um, the ranchers there are, uh, they're permittees. They uh, lease 
grazing privileges on our public lands. And the reason I just give you that for, for a little background. And I would ask you, James, <laughs> that one of the big reasons that I was delighted to do this panel is that there is such a lack of communication um, between users on the Little Missouri National Grasslands. And that, um, you know, Doug and I might share more that way in conservation and tourism and heritage and all that sort of thing. Um, but there's not a lot that goes on between conservation and the oil industry or conservation and uh, the grazing association members. Um, do you have any advice that you can give us as to how to further that communication with <coughs> ranchers? With, with the ranchers on the public lands. Usually I get paid for this. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Well, you've got two dinners with Dan. <laughs> Seriously, uh, you know, every individual gets to make his own decision as to what they want to do. But I think it goes back to what I said earlier. The relationships that we have with each other. Now, I'm not a permittee with the Forest Service. I happen to have a brother who has a permit with the Forest Service, and I happen to ride those hills many times when I was a, a child, too. A and, and so I'm somewhat familiar with that, and I have friends and neighbors who are permittees with the Forest Service. Sometimes that relationship is antagonistic because they really don't want big brother government, as they call it, telling them what to do. Uh, the other reality of it is that what it really amounts to is a communication process and a dialogue. And I think Rick could speak to that too, that we need to make sure that we're on the same wavelength. Here's where we are today. Where do we want to be in five years, 10 years? What do we want to preserve? We want to make sure that we have the whole situation continued and contained. What's really interesting about it is, as we look at ranching operations, we look at land and labor as the assets and cattle are the mechanism to provide the return for the investment with those assets. So we need to make sure that there is an opportunity for the cattle to be able to return an investment. And that is the same as sitting down with it, an investment counselor, so to speak. Call Dave Viper, the investment counselor that you have with the Forest Service. I might be stretching it a little bit, Dave. Huh? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> but the reality of it is, I think it's about relationships. There's no problem that's insurmountable if you have dialogue and have everybody's best interests in mind. And I know that I know you're speaking very carefully and that you also are honest about how ranchers on leased lands feel sometimes, but it does seem a little paradoxical that someone leasing land from the people of the United States would then regard them as big brother. I mean, big brother is a tyrant intruding upon people's liberties, but if I lease land from you, I don't know why I should call you big brother. You see what I'm saying? Well, I, I think, and perhaps I was a little bit loose with my tongue when I said but that. But I hear, I hear lots of people talking right. that way, so. But the, the point that I'm making is, and, and that is, this was a dry year. And I heard the reference made, I think Dandy made it earlier about falling back on your belt. And I tell you what, this was a year that put us back on our belt. You know, we had grass that yielded 40 pounds an acre. I mean, it was an absolute failure. So we had producers in our neighborhood that are on Forest Service land that experienced the same sort of thing. So the decision was made, hey, you have to sell 20 or 30 or 40 percent of your cows, which is really the mechanism by which you get a return on your investment of land and labor. So they're, they're saying, hey, be a little more flexible with us, work with us a little bit. And make it possible for us to find other solutions to difficult situations. Of course. Go ahead. You know, given that thought, uh, what are your thoughts on a forage reserve or grass bank? Last year, the Forest Service purchased the Ebert's Ranch. 
uh, also known as the Elkhorn Ranch. And we, we freed up about 23,000 acres of public lands. And just this week, uh, we issued a proposal to put those lands in a forage reserve. That would provide ranchers, especially in the Medora Grazing Association, some flexibility during times of drought, wildfire, or restoration. Do you think, or could you just comment on the idea? Well, I tell you what, I'm on the hot seat now. Wade, right up. <laughs> well, I'm not a scientist. I'm a beef cattle producer, and some of you might say someone who likes to talk. <laughs> but based on my limited understanding and discussions that I've had with scientists, grasses need annual grazing to stay at their maximum health and productivity. Now this is a 25 or longer year study done by a scientist here in Dickinson who talked about manipulating, and as I noted earlier in my comments, grazing grass between the three and a half leaf stage and before it flowers. That will cause plants to tiller underneath the soil and produce more shoots. Uh, his research has shown that not doing that creates situations where you have excessive shading, you do not get water retention into the soil like you could and or should, and it's not as healthy as working on the 50% leaf harvest and saving 50% of the plant, either in high structure or low structure. Just quick response to that. You know, well, let me rephrase the question. You know, a, a grass plant or forage reserve would or could be used on an annual basis. If it wasn't needed for an emergency, uh, perhaps a, a permittee could go get a number of yearlings, or if he needed some extra grazing to rest his own private property, we would still use those lands. So I want to make it clear that they'll be in production on an annual basis. All I'm talking about is flexibility. Well, and I'm not in the Little Missouri Grazing Association, I couldn't speak for them, but I think one thing that's important is that the people that are involved in that association want to make sure that beef cattle stay on that grass because that is the mechanism by which we harvest that and get a return on the land and the labor and also keep the grass healthy Understood. because that's an important part of the whole thing. As I noted earlier, that is what research has shown makes what's below ground healthier than what presently exists if it's managed properly. We are almost out of time. I want to make sure people with a burning thought can get in, starting here. Referring to what Jim has been talking about, the, the health of the grass, uh, there are some parts of the ecology that Theodore Roosevelt never saw, things like leafy spurge, Dalmatian toad flax, and the like. What threat do noxious weeds pose to the continued healthy ecology of the grasslands? Great question. I think that's yours. A tremendous threat. There's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, you know, we have a number of invasive species on the national grasslands. The Little Missouri, of course, and probably uh, the infestation on the Cheyenne national grasslands, uh, the tall grass prairie on the eastern side of the state, uh, is just uh, of a magnitude that's uh, almost indescribable. Probably fully 50% of that grassland is dominated by leafy spurge. But uh, we've had some real success out in the Little Missouri with the flea beetle, you know, and the spraying program. And uh, we've got before and after pictures, and uh, we're working in cooperation with the grazing associations and the county weed boards. So we're making progress on that. Now, I think a bigger issue, you know, we talk about that, I think uh, the encroachment of uh, juniper trees and woody draws is a bigger issue. You go out to some of the allotments, and I would challenge you to get some aerial photographs from the 1930s or 40s and get some present day aerial photographs and you will see the expansion of the juniper type in the landscapes that have never been seen before. That talks to restoration, that talks to fire on the landscape. That's why I promote a grass bank. When I talk to a permittee, I say, look, let's restore your allotment. Where do I go with my cows? I can move you on the grass bank, 
well, I'd burn these junipers and get some grass started uh, where it had been before. David, have you been seeing salt cedar moving down the Little Missouri towards? Yeah, we're aware of that, and uh, you know that that's that's a big issue. I worked in southern Colorado. Once it gets established, it changes the ecology of your riparian areas uh, in a significant way. Got time for one or two more? Here's one. I don't think that Jan's question has been answered about how the conservationists and the oil interests <coughs> and the ranchers and the grasslands people can better communicate so that some of these problems can be solved by the whole group. Can we get an answer to that? Who would you like that from? Jan, <laughs> because <laughs> well, uh, Dave, in some sense, you, you are required to make that conversation possible. <laughs> I am not required to do that. <laughs> yes, you are, because well, you yeah, balance absolutely. interests. And absolutely. I mean, that, that's a, an important question. Uh, collaboration, getting all the stakeholders at the table. And of course, it takes two to tangle. You know, you've got to want to come to the table and talk about the issues. That's part of the challenge that we're faced with. And I tell you what, we have a lot of good ranchers out in the Little Missouri National Grasslands uh, that, that know their land, that manage well, but we do have some issues with the associations. They're historical. They go back 40, 50 years. I think some of the fights, you know, it's kind of like my parents, what were you fighting about? I don't know, but we fight. <laughs> and that's, that's part of the culture here. When you, when you read some of the literature, uh, we like to fight, we do. How do we break through that? I, you know, I pound my head thinking about that. I go to alternative dispute resolution classes. I go to Missoula, to the university. Professor, help me, help me. And uh, we can't seem to break through. But I think we have to at some point. I, I think there are some, some folks out there that do want to open up and, and start talking. And I, I don't lay the onus on them. I lay it on my agency and the federal government, too. We're not always easy. You know, we've got our dictates. I, I almost brought a book in here, the, the Principal Laws of the U.S. Forest Service. It's that thick, <laughs> for God's sake. You know, I take that to a meeting. That's got to turn everybody off. But I think we have the latitude out here. I know I have the latitude for my bosses. Go do good things. Do smart things. Think. That's what Teddy wanted. That's what GIF wanted. You know, let's sit down and try to work something out. And I'll finish in a second. What I tell people over and over again, local solutions are much, much better than national solutions. When you lose the issue, when the courts get it, frequently you get a decision that nobody likes. So let's sit in the room and let's pound it out and let's work something, work something together. I think there's enough latitude in the process to do it. Let's do one more back here. I was just wondering if when we're talking about restoration and are we going back to the indigenous species of grass and floral, whatever that was in the area originally, are we talking about hybridized forms of grasses? And what are we restoring and how far back? Well, good question. Uh, I personally, and I think uh, the agency supports this, uh, we're looking at native prairie. You know, the Eberts Ranch, uh, we have probably, what, six, eight hundred acres of farm ground out there. Our plan is to restore that with native grasses. You know, we can work with the NRCS in the state. They, they've got, uh, you know, some lands right there south of Bismarck, and uh, you know, our plan is to use native grasses for restoration. I want to go down the line, give everyone a last chance to speak a word. I'm sorry. I want to just apologize to everyone. Um, one answer to your question about communication is you don't try to do it in an hour and 30 minutes. Um, this, this could have been the symposium, but I wanted at least to get this conversation here. Uh, I think it's been a really good one. I've been really delighted by how sweet everyone is. This usually, <laughs> this could go sour really quickly, and we had a couple of moments there, but we ducked them. I'm going to give Dan the last word, but I'm going to start with Jan and have each of you say just something in closing, knowing that we didn't get a chance to really dig in. Jan. Um, how long do I have? <laughs> um, We're going to be out of here by 5 o'clock. You see that clock? Um, I, I need to, to respond to James' comment about grass just, just briefly and that it needs to be grazed every year. And, you know, historically, if we go, be if we go beyond it, backwards, 
Um, you know, bison certainly did not graze. Um, wildlife did not graze grass every year, and uh, it's it's the ecosystem. Their ecosystem was their ecosystem, and it was it was meant to be. It's it's a matter of looking at uses, and and the Little Missouri National Grassland has multiple uses, and I guess the one that I stand in defense of, um, not because it's the only one that I believe should be out there. I think we need oil development, and I think we need to keep our ranchers out there. But, but it is wildlife, and, um, and our own recreational, spiritual, innate landscape values um, are also uses out there. Um, and I do need to bring up um, our Prairie Legacy uh, Wilderness proposal one more time. Um, it's 4% of the 1.1 million acres that make up the Little Missouri National Grasslands. There's 5,000 acres, 5,400, um, on the Cheyenne National Grasslands, which is the tall grass over in the eastern part of the state by Lisbon. And, um, you know, considering that, that oil and gas leasing is open on 95% of the Little Missouri and that um, grazing occurs on 87% of the Little Missouri National Grasslands, with the rest being too steep to be uh, to be grazed, um, and in that grazing will continue should wilderness designation come to pass. That that we as North Dakotans, I mean, if if we protect prairie churches because they're valuable, why would we not want to look at protecting four percent? of our 1.1 million acre public lands. Thank you. Mark. I think there's actually a lot of communication that goes on out there. I think what we need to do is uh, work on the quality of communication in a lot of, in a lot of ways. The, uh, from the wilderness proposal, as it relates to conservation in the room, put my oil and gas hat on, we're opposed to wilderness designation because we want access. But that being said, we're willing to trade some things for certainty of process. So take the 4%, take it out of our hands, then leave me alone in my existing industrial complex and just let me go about my business. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, no. it's, it's balance is there. It's not, it's, not that we're, it's not that we, I don't understand the fight uh, between us. I do, process. if you're saying leave us alone on 95% no, no, no. of the acreage. <laughs> well, but, but there's, there's some things there that are developed, some things are not developed. And so, in, for instance, in the Freiburg at Wadora oil field, I'm unsure why I'm jumping through extensive hoops to execute something that's going to be executed anyway. Now, if I go stepping out there into some of that in-between that's least and not, perhaps you need to put higher scrutiny on me. So, it's where we, where we marshal our limited resources to manage these things is what needs to come clarity and I'm not sure how we can jump to a hundred years in the future when we are having a hard time admitting where we're at just right now in time. <laughs> Good point. Jim Oderman. Thank you. Hey, I want to just uh, read a little line here that I got from Sharon. Actually it was a line that Clay had written and it, it directly answers the question that this the young lady here asked earlier about Jan's question hadn't been answered, and that is, I ask each of you to do the best listening to everyone else that you can, because good listening is the root of all breakthroughs in communication. And so that's really what we have to do, is we need to have dialogue, and we need to make sure that we're listening to each other, and, and we're working for the common good. The thought I'd like to just close with is, and, and I just love this phrase yesterday, the cradle of conservation. It would really be kind of a neat place to be able to have the cradle of conservation in Billings County. But I can pretty much tell you right now that the egg producers in Billings County would give it a thumbs down until they saw the fine print. I think the concept, and I mean, being in the marketing business a little bit, this is what I, and I wrote this down here so I wouldn't forget it. An alliterative, catchy, Madison Avenue marketing slogan 
that will be able to garner big bucks from conservation foundations, private donors, and government grants. I really think it's a neat idea. If we could get everybody on board and make sure that everybody's protected, oh, wouldn't that be a neat thing to have in Western North Dakota? I'm trying to decide if you're for it or against it after that. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a nice point. Doug Ellison. Well, I've, I've uh, enjoyed listening to this. I've learned a lot personally. Uh, it's clear there may not be any easy answers, but there are answers, obviously. Uh, one thing I'd just like to share, a couple of weeks ago, my family and I were out uh, in the National Park on the Jones C Creek Trail hike. There's a guest book at the end of the path, and uh, I'm scanning that. And uh, On one of the pages, uh, a hiker had written, boring, exclamation mark. On the same page, someone had written, awesome, exclamation mark. So there are differing opinions. You know, people look at the same issue and have totally opposite impressions. Uh, so again, there, there may not be easy answers, but there are answers, and talking is the key. David Piper. Yes, sir. Well, Jan alluded a couple times to the grassland plan, and I think uh, forest planning, grassland planning was uh, Hubert Humphrey's brainchild way back when, you know, our neighbor to the east. And the idea was, you know, we're going to make allocations. That's how we're going to make people happy. I'm going to give Jane her 50,000 acres of wilderness. Mark is 940,000 acres of oil and gas. <laughs> you, your recreation trail, et cetera, et cetera. Isn't everybody happy today? I mean, I, I don't quite understand it. But I'm not so concerned about those allocations as I am sustainability. You know, I think we have to look at the entire grasslands and make sure that it is ecologically sustainable for future generations. And in doing so, you know, we have to keep people economically viable. Now, will there be a shakeout? I'll tell you what, on the national grasslands, our average permittee has about 115 head permit. You know, and I know, you can't make a living off that. Not 115 head. NDSU tells us you need probably four to 500 head. So we're seeing leasing. We're seeing these people come in from outside of North Dakota, buying their trophy ranch and leasing it to their neighbor. I don't think that's good business, personally. I think that neighbor should have the opportunity to have that federal grazing allotment permanently so that he or she can build on a foundation for their future. When you lease from a private landowner who lives in Texas or Arizona, you're susceptible to all kinds of whims. I don't think that's sustainable. That's what's happening on our grasslands. We need to be careful about that. I want to conclude by thanking you for inviting me. Uh, I think this has been very, very interesting. I hope we helped you a little bit uh, to inform you about multiple use management and, and the difficulties. It's challenging, but it's very, very interesting. And, you know, get involved. Uh, if you figure out, you know, how we can bust through in that communication thing, give me a call. I'm, I'm going to ask Dan Flores to give us the last word, and then Marty will come up, um, Marty Odom and Gardner, and, and give us some thoughts about what, how we get back on track here. But uh, I just want to agree with Jim, I think. I'm not sure. I, I would oppose cradle of conservation on historical grounds, but I also think that it's a divisive term. Uh, that hypes the actual situation and would create more trouble than it's worth. It would be like saying that Oyster Bay, Sagamore Hill, is the cradle of the Panama Canal. Um, you can see the point, but it sort of is a distorted one, in my view. Uh, Dan Flores, you've heard all of this. We're just getting started. I wish we had two more days on this, but take two to three minutes to wrap up for us. Well, I, I guess my first impression is how reasonable and rational and civilized you North Dakotans are. <laughs> You're very polite. Uh, we can hardly have discussions like this in Montana. Uh, in fact, the Forest Service has from time to time had to call off public meetings over threats of violence to people who are going to appear and speak. I mean, this has happened more than once in the area where I live. and so. I, you know, 
for one thing, this kind of thing where federal managers of national grasslands, particularly national grasslands administered by the Forest Service or BLM or sometimes Park Service decisions too, that they get to go before the public, that you actually have public meetings where people can weigh in and engage like this is, again, as a historian, this is the legacy of Pinchot and Roosevelt. They gave us this. The reason this strikes me as something to observe, I mean, it would seem self-evident, except that I've lived in parts of the West on the Southern Plains where the decisions are not public decisions. Where all the land is privately owned, the decisions get made outside the public realm. You just pick up the newspaper one morning and discover that someone has decided to do something, and since it take pl takes place on private land, there's no recourse. So I think, again, I want to go back to a point that I was making, and it's because of my diverse experience in the West. Uh, you guys in this part of the world really are the model for the rest of the Great Plains with a million, more than a million acres of national grasslands and a national park um, with 80% of your grasslands still intact, virtually nowhere else on the Great Plains, has these kinds of things in place. So not to put the burden on you too much, but all the rest of us are looking at you to get it right, and we're going to follow your model in hopes that you do get it right. Uh, so, in case you didn't know that, I just wanted to bring you the news that <laughs> that's the way it's playing out elsewhere up and down the plane. Uh, Doug Ellison, David Piper, Jan Swenson, Mark Trimmer, Jim Oderman, Dan Flores, thank you all very much.